economics is an objective science in precisely the same sense as any of the physical sciences. And although I do want to point out that I do feel that there is great merit in the quantitative, to the quantitative study of economics, but I believe it's only part of the picture. And actually to describe economics in that limited way, divorced from issues of morality and of justice is actually irresponsible, negligent, and even dangerous. And actually, in fact, that this limited view of economics is actually one of the root causes to the economic challenges that we face. And I know you know about them, but the challenges that I'm talking about that, that break my heart are seeing greed, seeing inequality, seeing exploitation around the world, material deprivation, violence, species extinction, and climate chaos. So for me, the, to return economics to the realm of moral philosophy would instead help us to face these challenges because in doing so, we would have to interrogate and debunk the assumptions and the biases that underpin this scientific and objective view. So which are the ones that I'm talking about? What are the assumptions and the biases and the beliefs that underpin this limited objective scientific view of economics? Well, they include things like the idea that economics is something only economists can understand. And it's really just relegated to things having to do with money and finance, and that it's only relegated to the business section of the newspaper. It's also the view that human nature can be described by homo economicus. This idea that our species is inherently rational, competitive, and self-interested. So that's kind of our human nature. This, this belief also is underpinned by the idea that we are separate from nature and that nature is a commodity, that nature is there for our use and exploitation, and that we can put a monetary value on a tree, on a river, on a lake. It's also the bias that the white Western patriarchal view of economics is the only legitimate view of economics worth studying. And that to study, to study other views, you have to study something like economic anthropology or heterodox economics. And this really relates to something Winona said last night. She said that to study indigenous art at Harvard, she had to study kind of the Native American department class on art instead of the art department. So this is the same thing with economics. It's relegated to economic anthropology and heterodox economics if you want to study some alternative views. The other thing is the assumption that private ownership, development, and growth are always good. It's also the belief that there is no alternative to capitalism and the view that work is a disutility and the little of it, or the less of it that we can do, the better. Lastly, this scientific view is also underpinned by the assumption that inequality, homelessness, and unemployment are inevitable. I remember I went to Montregon, the cooperative ecosystem in the Basque region of Spain, and one of the researchers there, Gorka Espiau, he told me, he said, you know, the most shocking thing to me is that when he travels around the world to places like San Francisco, where I'm from, the fact that people look at him and they say, well, of course, isn't inequality, isn't the homelessness that we see, isn't that inevitable? And he turned to me and he said, Della, it's not inevitable. So interrogating and dismantling these assumptions, these beliefs, these biases, what they'll do is they'll help us to develop a field of economics that is more moral, holistic, just, and sustainable. And they will also, by doing this, will also be helped to enable a clearer way to this thing that we're looking at today, this thing of the next economy. So what is the next economy? 
Uh, to me, what I would first say to define it is I would really name the wisdom traditions and the movements that have helped to create and bring about this idea of the next economy. So I just want to name them to bring them into the, work, into, the, into the room because of all the leaders and the actions and the movements that have really brought us to this conversation we're having. So this includes social and solidarity economics, indigenous economics, new economics, the caring economy, the gift economy, the feminist economics or Marxist feminist economics, eco-socialism, Buddhist economics, Marxism, regenerative economics, ecological economics. I believe that all of these have influenced and inspired the movement of new, the next economy that we're looking at today. And I think in this way, looking at all of these, we can see that this next economy is pluralistic. That there is both unity, there's both similarity, there's both a cohesion and um, things that we can unite around, but there's also diversity. And I think that's important. And I think what that tells us is that this next economy is inclusive and it's diverse, it's solidaristic across movements and across place. Um, and it's also distributed. There's not kind of a central authority on the next economy. There's many views. It's like a diamond that has many different sides and we can look through different sides to see different truths about this thing that is the next economy. And also this next economy is co-created, it's co-designed, and it's truly democratic. And this is why we're having the, the more participatory part of the afternoon. So this is not expert driven, this is a collective process in coming to know what is the next economy together. The other thing is another way to look at what is the next economy is to look at what is its goal. And the reason why I bring this up is based off of the work of Danella Meadows, the great systems theorist. She talks about if we want to change a system, for example, go from this economy that we are currently in, this current dominant economy, to the next economy or a different system, one of the highest points of leverage is to change the goal of the system. So for me, when I look at the goal of the current dominant capitalist, um, heteronormative, patriarchal economy, extractive economy, what I see is that it's growth oriented, blind growth oriented, that the, the rise of GDP, gross domestic product, is the ultimate goal. And that to change that goal is part of what is this next economy. So again, what is the goal of the next economy? I think that's something that we all can explore together. But for me, my interpretation or what resonates for me is that the goal of the next economy is to alleviate suffering and support the thriving of all beings. To alleviate suffering and support the thriving of all beings. And the alleviation of suffering for me comes from my background in Buddhist economics. And this relates to the fact that there's a difference in, in the Buddhist philosophy between pain and suffering. So pain is an inevitable part of life. Old age, sickness, death, these are inevitable. And I'm not trying to end pain in the economy. This isn't just a total hedonistic, feel good, next system. But it's to alleviate the suffering, the unnecessary harm that comes from our own actions, but also our systems that can sometimes be racist, oppressive, extractive, etc. So for me, it's to alleviate suffering and then also support the thriving of all beings. And that's an important point too, the thriving of all beings, and this has been mentioned, but not just all humans, which can even be challenging itself, and I mean all humans in terms of um, everywhere in the world, I mean all races, all areas, but also all beings beyond just the human world, the more than human world. So, and not just plants and animals, but also our rivers, our trees, our ecosystems, and the living planet itself. So what then does it mean to be this next economy? So what I wanna do then is I want to bring in, after that amazing talk by Winona last night, I wanna bring in the voice of another Native woman. Her name is Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, she is the, uh, she's a professor of environmental and forest biology. She's an author. 
She's a member of the Potawatomi Nation, and she wrote one of her amazing books is this book called Braiding Sweetgrass. So I really, I just want to read a, cha a little uh, paragraph from that book because I think it can help us in this exploration of what is the next economy and what does it mean for us to become the next economy. So here's the paragraph. A bay is a noun only if water is dead. It is defined by humans. If it's defined by humans, it's trapped between its shores and contained by the word. But the verb, wikiwagama, from the Ojibwe language, to be a bay, releases the water from bondage and lets it live. To be a bay holds the wonder that for this moment, the living water has decided to shelter itself between these shores, conversing with cedar roots and a flock of baby mergansers because the water could do otherwise. It could become a stream or an ocean or a waterfall. And there are verbs for that too. To be a hill, to be a sandy beach, to be a Saturday. All are possible verbs in a world where everything is alive. Water, land, and even a day. The language a mirror for seeing the animacy of the world. The life that pulses through all things, through pines and nut hatches and mushrooms. This is the language of animacy. So that was from Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. And I bring that in because I want us to explore what would it mean to be the next economy? What would that mean? So for me to be the next economy means to have an orientation towards that goal that I described, the alleviation of suffering and the thriving of all living beings. So for me, it means to turn towards life, as the eco-philosopher and activist Joanna Macy would say, to turn from life destructive and, and, and life extractive to life sustaining and life thriving, to turn towards life as our orientation. And also, what does it mean to be the next economy? For me, it means, as the poet Rilke once wrote, to live our lives in widening circles. What I mean by this is to not see being the new economy or the next economy, not just in terms of our individual selves, not just in terms of our consumptions, but collectively. So to live our lives in widening circles, to be the next economy in widening circles, means also to look at our systems that we create and that we contribute to. And also here, it's important to note that to be the next economy doesn't just mean to exit the current economy and live as if we're living on lily pads of next economies or new economies that are separate from leaving many still in the life-destructive system. It means that we need to make our, our, ne our next economy, our life-sustaining economy, more inclusive and more able to hold more people. So I have two invitations for us today as we continue. I want us to practice being the next economy. This is an invitation. What would it mean if today we became the next economy? What would we do differently? How would we sit? How would we talk to one another? What conversations would we have? Maybe we're already doing it, but I just want to invite that question. How can we see the economy as not something outside of us, but as something that we're co-creating and we're living and we're embodying right here, right now? And then also, of course, I want us to, as I said in the beginning, I want us to rethink economics and rethink our relationship to this thing called the economy. I want us to interrogate the assumptions and beliefs that we have about human nature, that we have about economics, that we have about progress, growth, development. And I also want us to start to interrogate economists, politicians, and professors to challenge what is economics and what is the economy. So that we not only invite ourselves to do that work, but we invite others to do the same. So I'm just gonna end with a poem. This is a poem that I wrote called What is Economics? 
So this is a poem, and then, yeah, just want to continue with that invitation and excited to explore the rest of this with you today. So this is a poem called, What is Economics? Economics is about our relationship with ourselves. It is about how we use our time, what we do for leisure, our pace, about our ratio of being to doing, about our connection with our passions, our hobbies, about that which we can call our own, about our locus of control, about our sense of self-worth, about the rhythm of our days, our relationships to the seasons, about how we introduce ourselves, about our past, the quality of our present, and how we envision our future, about our freedoms, our constraints, about how we meet our needs, about our role in society, our right livelihood, our mythopoetic identity. Economics is about our relationship with each other. It's about whether we see collaborators or competitors, separation or solidarity, interbeing or alienation. It's about our level of trust it's about the quality of our democracy, about how we relate to power, about how we manage our housework, our child rearing, our commons, about how we care and how we get cared for and who we share with, what we give and what we get and how much we tell one another. Economics is about our relationship with earth. It's about our connection with land our bioregion, our watershed, about our sense of belonging, about what we build and how we build it, about what and how we eat, where our food comes from, what we wear, and what happens to our waste. About whether we see the natural world as a supply house or a sewer, a battlefield or a lover, an animate being or our larger self. Economics has the ability to isolate, subjugate, unite, and empower. It's myth and fact, crisis and opportunity, alive and lifeless, systemic and personal. Economics is not simply the bottom line, the marketplace, the profit margin, or the banknote. And it's not something outside of us. Economics is valueful, valuable, and here. Thank you, everyone.